If you're looking for the next best thing to invest in, try investing in your long-term health with Forward. Forward is intelligent medicine with a personal touch. Their doctors are dedicated to catching top killers like cancer and heart disease early, which could save you tens of thousands of dollars in the long run. So invest in a doctor that's invested in you. Visit GoForward.com to learn more about how Forward can help you manage your long-term health risks for one flat monthly fee. That's GoForward.com. My name is Kathleen Stock. Um, I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Sussex. And I write about publicly about um, sex and gender and feminism and sexual orientation. I've just written a book called Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. In this episode, I speak to Kathleen Stock, who has just given a wonderful introduction to herself, so I don't think there's any need for me to say anything else about it. I'm here in County Wicklow, and there's just been a July downpour. <laughs> to leave that in. Come on. Downpour. And this, there's just one thing I want to mention before we go into the interview. And that is, uh, during the interview, I mentioned that in the book, Kathleen Stock talks about uh, the four axioms of what are described, uh, the four axioms of modern trans activism, which she examines from different angles in the book. I just want to go through them very briefly. Number one is that you and I and everyone else have an important inner state called a gender identity. Number two, for some people, inner gender identity fails to match the biological sex, male or female, originally assigned to them at birth by medics. These are trans people. Number three, gender identity, not biological sex, is what makes you a man or a woman or a neither. What does that mean, or neither? You could be non-binary, so that you, you don't identify as being either a man or a woman. And number four, the existence of trans people generates a moral obligation upon all of us to recognise and legally to protect gender identity and not biological sex. So with that, we'll flick to the interview. And I started by asking Kathleen, why did she write the book? I wrote this book because... Um I thought I could contribute to the discussion and I had something to bring. So the, the discussion is between um, what people call trans rights, uh, although sometimes I think what's claimed under that heading isn't really about rights at all, and feminism. Uh, and there's obviously a big toxic, di di I don't know, debate, what do you call it, war, <laughs> row going on. And I'm a philosopher, so a lot of the uh, intellectual background that's used by trans activists um, refers to philosophical context and concepts. And I thought I could um, help by sort of putting my own opinionated take on things and trying to clarify some issues like the way gender is used, this word gender that means like four different things at least. So that's why I wrote it really. I mean, from a pers on a personal level, I've been writing um, about this in public for about three years. And uh, so I've been writing blog posts and bits and pieces for various magazines and things like that. Uh, but this is like my best attempt to lay it all out, you know, at length, clearly. Mm. It's a great book. And I think it's really important for anybody who's kind of delving into the area and who wants to know. Uh, I mean, some of the things that I think you do brilliantly in it are, you know, uh, looking at the axioms of gender identity theory, which mm -hmm. just sets it out really nice and clearly. You know, <laughs> this is exactly what it means. And um, people can read it for themselves. I don't want to go too much into that. And also mm -hmm. um, the different ways gender is the term gender is used. So you can have somebody in a conversation using the term gender 
applying to a few different uh, concepts. So it mm-hmm. becomes really complicated. Yeah. But I want to go back a little bit then. So you said about three years ago, you started writing about these issues. Mm-hmm. What was it that <laughs> initially Pushed got you over to, the edge? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pushed you over the edge, got you into <laughs> looking at this issue. Well, I, for a start, I'm, I'm lesbian. So um, I was already aware that there were trans women on dating apps when I was dating. And, you know, I mean... I don't mean sort of what you might call passing trans women. I mean, people that clearly looked male yet were calling themselves lesbian and were on my dating app coming up as suggestions for me. So I knew that there was some kind of mixing going on of concepts here, you know, because I'm a lesbian, I'm attracted to females. So that doesn't include trans women. Um, And that's not an insult (laughs) to trans women. That's just a kind of statement of my orientation. So I knew about it. And then I also, in my professional life, so in a, I'm an academic and you, as you no doubt know, universities mostly are um, at the forefront of whatever radical politics is sweeping the nation. And um, so everything's about self-ID at my university. Every, I saw a menopause group the other day open to anyone who identifies as a woman and, um, any 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 event about the gender pay gap is open to anyone who identifies as a woman, <laughs> you know. So, um, and in in philosophy, like the Society for Women in Philosophy, which is supposed to represent women, and there aren't that many women in philosophy, is open to anyone who identifies as a woman. So, that was already irritating me, to be honest. Um, quite a lot because I think in all those areas, these are things that the gender pay gap, the menopause and, uh, um, you know, being a woman in philosophy, those are things that happen to females. So uh, I thought it was really unhelpful to mix all that up. And I started to, and then the thing that pushed me over the edge, I suppose, is just seeing how um, women who were trying to talk about this were treated. Like um, I started looking at Women's Place UK, which is a grassroots organisation set up to allow women to be able to talk about these changes in policy and law that affect them. And they were having bomb threats and um, just this huge monstering uh, of their reputations and their characters going on. And and then in philosophy, no one was sticking up for them. And in fact, lots of people were joining in. Um, it just it really enraged me. It's not what I went into academia for. So I just decided one day to press. I wrote a blog post, press send, went for a walk, (laughs) came back, saw that I was being denounced. (laughs) And that's how it started. (laughs) Really? Was it? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So it was in the course of one day, you just kind of said all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I asked a question. I wrote a a blog post and put it on Medium, which is like a self-publishing platform I didn't have many followers or anything like that and I just said why is academic philosophy ignoring questions about gender recognition reform because you know normally academic philosophers will argue about anything with you like they'll argue about euthanasia about um, abortion about all these so really controversial areas and they can take quite extreme positions and nobody seems to mind but we were at the time in in the UK being publicly consulted by the government about our views like as a as a nation and yet I didn't see any academics um criticizing the plans to move to self-ID that were in in the mix at the time I saw lots of people applauding them but I didn't see anyone criticizing them and I thought that was a gap and I was curious so why well I mean I kind of knew why to be honest because everyone's frightened basically right so your initial blog was centred around a question then. Why aren't people discussing this? Why aren't people discussing it? And then I also said, we're going to have to ask the question, are trans women women? Because you can't not ask that question. And it is a philosophical question. I asked, what is a woman? And, um, you know, again, we're supposed to be talking about definitions all the time in philosophy. So I asked the question about that. And you see, even to ask that question was obviously a red rag to for many people in philosophy they just they you can't even ask that question and at the time I, I actually didn't know what the answer was because I knew that trans women weren't 
female, but there is a there is a view in philosophy which I discuss in my book that being a woman is not the same as being female. And I wanted to think about that before I kind of came out and said what I thought. So it took me about a year, I think, to work out what I thought about that. Uh, But so I didn't, at that point, I was quite careful not, I kept talking about females and not women, but you're not even allowed to talk about females. That's, that became clear, quite obvious. That, sorry, that became um, clear quite early on, that you're not even allowed to say that trans women are male bodied people. People were like, oh God, she's saying male body, that's just such a dog whistle <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> it is the idea that uh, they have a female penis, isn't it? That's kind of the thing these days. Well, it's a sort of logical extension. If you're not allowed to say that they have male bodies, uh, then... Um, the penis becomes female. I, exactly. The penis is no longer male. And then what is it? Well, I mean, I've seen some crazy circular reasoning. You know, I, I have a female penis because I am a female. Well, you're not, you know, you're, unfortunately, you're not a female and you don't have a female penis because there's no such thing. Right. So when you when you um, brought out this blog, which I probably read, <laughs> you know, you read so much, I think, when oh, you yeah. start to delve into these issues, it, it's it's kind of mind boggling and it's hard to let go of it when you realise what's actually going on, I think. Mm. I know that's what happened to me, um, that it, it's just, the more you read and see what's going on, the, it's kind of incredible. And it, it, for me, it's like, I can't understand why other people can't see what's going on. And I, I do understand yeah. there's a huge amount of fear. But for yeah. you, you wrote this blog. Were you afraid? Uh, not immediately, although I did realise that I was going to get a lot of flack, but I didn't realise how much flack I would get. I think I was naive um, to be honest. So no, initially I just thought, I think I was really naive because I thought, okay, I'll get some, I'll get some arguments, but basically once I draw people's attention, especially in academic philosophy to this issue, then they'll start arguing about it. And then the normal, and then it'll be business as usual and they'll get involved and start speaking up. And I'll, you know, maybe I thought I was drawing attention to an issue that philosophers were not aware of that they would then feel compelled to get involved in because I knew that not everybody thought that gender identity was more important than sex that would be really unusual for everyone in philosophy to feel the same way about that but no that's not what happened it is sort of happening a bit more now three years later gradually (laughs) one by one some philosophers are sort of popping up to start talking about this but it's taken a long time and initially they just um the most that they felt they could do the ones that were supportive of me was to say that I should have the right to say what I was saying so that's a kind of fallback position like they don't actually want to pronounce on the issue (laughs) of whether trans women are women or whether gender identity is more important than sex but they do want to stand up for my right to say or to ask questions about that so that's nice. <laughs> that's good of them. You, and I might, do appreciate it. <laughs> did you get any support originally from other philosophers in academia? Well, yeah, I got, I got, like I say, I got support for my right to speak. But it's, but um, no. Did, not even one? Oh, no, yeah, sorry. There are, there's a handful of very intrepid women philosophers. Um, Mary Leng uh, is one at University of York. Sophie Allen. Uh, Holly, uh, who's at the University of Kiel, Holly Lawford Smith, who's at the University of Melbourne, and and there are a couple of others too. And they, um, this is from within universities. They uh, have tried to argue about this and are p- trying to publish papers. And you know, so we we form a little gang. Great. How bad did it get for you? What was the worst thing <laughs> things that happened? Huh. Well, I mean, it's been a long. You know, it's been three years and I don't know if I've got sort of a top 10 of terrible things. But, you know, I've had a lot of I've been no platform. So that is I've been invited, I suppose, de-platformed is the right word because I get invited to things and then there's huge protest and then the invitation is withdrawn. I've had um, harassment, you know, on campus. I've had protests on campus, stickers on my door saying I'm a turf. I've had... Uh, People send me stuff in the post that's not particularly great. Um, I've had a lot of hostility from colleagues, like professional colleagues, adults, 
at my own institution online saying I'm you know defaming me saying I'm a danger to trans students which is not true at all and actually I you know some trans people agree with me some people disagree with me but I teach trans students professionally and normally um I'm trying to think I mean it's just a sort of relentless hostility from quite a small number of people relatively speaking but you know over time it can get really exhausting particularly because you feel so alone because there's nobody that other people see what's happening to you and then they don't want to say that they support you in case the kind of the outrage machine wheels around and starts to target them so it's the isolation combined with the harassment that is psychologically tiring at times yeah. Uh, that's a good phrase, the outrage machine. <laughs> you know, um, I, then, like, do you ever just feel like, oh, I've had enough of this. I don't want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> yeah, and but actually, I, I mean, I'm I'm talking about my book now with you, and I'm t- I've done some other stuff, but I actually genuinely don't want to talk about this anymore. In the sense that I've written the book now that right. says everything I want to say, and. I don't think, I mean, although I'm always open to changing my mind as a philosopher, as part of my job, I really don't think I'm going to change my mind on this stuff because it's so obvious that to me that there are two sexes, that people cannot change sex, that, you know, it's a fiction that trans women are women and that trans men are men. And it may be a fiction that we go along with in some contexts, but benevolently for good reasons, but it's not literally true so I I know this now I also know that lesbians are people are females attracted to females you know nothing's going to change my mind about that so um I want to move on to more interesting things because it's it's not hard to come up with these arguments intellectually it's it's hard psychologically because you face so much flack for doing it but it's not like the biggest challenge to establish that there's two sexes (laughs) Mm. and what has the reception the book is out now about two months is it came out in may may 2021 Mm -hmm. so what has the reception been like it's been great um i've been really pleased with the reviews um it's not going to please everybody but you know in the mainstream i wrote it for the mainstream Uh, you know i wrote it for people who are not already convinced maybe who've seen the row and really are not sure where to go or what to think about it. So I wanted to provide a kind of reassuring guide, you know, that is clearly not bigoted and not (laughs) um, transphobic, but is also prepared to articulate some perhaps uncomfortable realities responsibly. So that's what I tried to do. Now, that means that for some people I'm outrageous and I'm saying things that they really don't want to hear and they don't want anyone else to hear. And for some other people within the feminist movement, um, I am far too uh, timid and not radical enough and a bit of a collaborator and a capitulator and all that. So I get <laughs> I get flack on both sides. Um, that's fine. That's probably expected given where I'm pitching it and what the book says. So I'm happy with what I said. It's what I think. In the first few weeks, it went into the charts. How's it doing at the moment? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. It was in the top ten. It was in the top. It it was eleven. It was hardback nonfiction. It was number eleven. It was just outside the top ten the first week, which was amazing, absolutely amazing for a book on like popular philosophy. I was really proud of that. Um, and it's been up and down the Amazon charts. I don't know. I think it's like 2000 or something now. Um, right. it's, yeah, it's going to be released in America in September. Ooh. So at the moment, it's just Britain. Right. I think. And ha- has the has the heat on you increased since the book com- has come out or? Mm. Is no, it a case I mean, of it can't been... really get much worse? <laughs> no, I mean, it's not noticeably. It's, it, things happen and then they past you know so there's a couple of things going on at the moment there's a couple of attempts to um so I've joined an editorial board of a new journal a new philosophy journal I actually was invited for my work on fiction 
and there's there's attempts to get me removed from that board um you know i'm contributing a an article to another journal and there's been an attempt to stop that happening but you know these things sort of bubble up and then they disappear and then they bubble up and i i'm a got a lot i've got a lot thicker skin these days so i really don't take it massively personally and are these journals anymore. academic journals that have anything to do with gender necessarily no no, no. Right. but they still <laughs> no they don't just want to have a, no i mean that, that's that's the level we're dealing with that i by certain people i am designated you know unclean <laughs> uh doesn't matter what i do so i've had i've had um protests against papers that aren't anything to do with trans people just don't want me around because they say I, I make them feel uncomfortable or unsafe uh which is nonsense and it's and actually I mean in January there was an open letter written against me by and signed by lots and lots of philosophers and it became clear in the content of this letter which made all these defamatory claims about me like outrageous claims about me but they made specific claim about what I think that was false and demonstrably false so in other words they don't even know what I think I'd be very surprised if my most vocal critics were actually reading my book because they don't want to know. They just want to stay with the caricature of the horrible person that they've got. And they don't want to update it in terms of real-time information because that would be embarrassing for them, I assume. So, yeah, there will be people that go to their graves thinking that I am the world's worst, but I can live with that. Yeah, it makes sense that they don't want to read your book. I mean, the argument that you have of being immersed in a fiction, <laughs> if they read the book, it might... I, that that's kind of one of the main contributions I think your book is making, isn't it? To to the mm. the discourse yeah. on gender, this idea of being immersed in a fiction. But if um if they read the book, then the fiction they'd have to kind of acknowledge that. Okay, yeah, that's, and I think that's yeah. Well, uh, sorry, go on. No, well, that's where the the challenge is because people don't want that fiction. Yeah, that realization. I think that's true. And I, I actually address that in the book, that the yeah. thing about being immersed in a fiction, and of course we do this all the time, it's a perfectly normal part of human life. We have this capacity to lose ourselves in dramas or novels or s films or role plays or gaming. You know, some people spend hours every day, me included, actually, because I read a lot of fiction. But you don't, when you're in that world, imaginary world or fictional world you don't want to be reminded that it's just a fiction because that kind of ruins the whole immersion that's just a that's an artifact of lots of engagement with fiction and I do think that that's playing a role here in why um there's so much thought suppression or speech suppression attempted thought suppression control of language shutting down of arguments shutting down of raising questions because they start to expose the internal in co contradictions in the whole um, scenario. Um, and that starts to draw attention to the fact it's not really true. Now, I'm not, I, I don't want your listeners to misunderstand me because I'm not saying it's delusional. I'm not saying it's, it's, there's anything wrong with it even. Because like I say, I think actually being immersed in fiction can be a really valuable part of life. It allows you to explore new perspectives and you know, protect yourself in some ways from really difficult psychological uh, events, but it has its limits. And the trouble is at the moment, we're being compelled in the UK to go along with a fiction. You know, we have to put, in some organisations, you have to put your pronouns in your email, even if you've got no idea what that means. You have to observe the preferred pronouns even of male rapists in female prisons <laughs> you know it's just got out of control this this whole apparatus so we need to inject some reality back in in the right contexts yeah i mean in in the the subtitle for the book you have that word reality we have gone so far away from it mm. like language has become the be all and end all in a way this idea of mm -hmm. and that we're we were socially constructed. I was, God, I can't remember what book it was I was reading recently. Um, but it was very interesting in that I was saying that the move to culture and the focus on culture was connected to World War II and the development, you know, of Darwinianism and eugenics so that biology became a kind of a bad thing. The focus on 
evolution mm. because then it led to eugenics and to genocide. So mm. the focus then switched to culture was <laughs> what was considered to be more important then. And that made sense to me. Well, I mean, I'm not a historian, but I what I could say is I think that we all have this very vexed relationship between what is the case and what ought to be the case, as in um, in philosophy we call it the ought is relationship. The, um, you know what between what des- what you describe as the the facts about the world and what then what you prescribe as what should be happening, and I think there's you can go too far in the opposite direction. You can think that facts about biology just on their own tell you what to, you should be doing. And that's clearly present in some anti-feminism, which sees the fact that women can have children as kind of showing that they should be having children or they should be at home or they should be, um, you know, out of the workplace. So that's, and actually really annoyingly, our critics, you know, my critics would say that that's my position. That's clearly not my position. I'm not giving biology anything like that sort of importance in determining what should be the case. But you can go too far in the other direction and just completely deny the facts of biology. Think that, you know, it's sort of, who it's totally hubristic. And it's, it's, it's just um, kind of rationalism gone mad to think that we can make up the world through our thoughts, um, even collectively or individually. So we've got to, as in all things, find a balance, <laughs> find the, the mean, the, as Aristotle would say, between the two extremes. <clears throat> um, and that's why, I'm, in a way, that's what I'm trying to do in the book, although I don't put it in those terms. Yeah, there is a, like, it's a basic thing. Biology does matter. But to even say that these days, you can be accused of being transphobic. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know, it's just... It blows my mind that we've got to this point and I do find it scary as well because I've I've been involved in, in the debate to a certain extent. I also think Twitter and social media is so inflammatory <laughs> and then people see like, oh, of what they're saying on Twitter and then you meet them in real life and you have a conversation. Actually, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, it's it's like two different worlds in a way. Yeah. Well, but, yes, because Twitter is the world's worst format for um, good faith rational dialogue uh you know just the fact that the character limit is so small so you can't really say what you want to um very easily it lends itself to misunderstanding and the fact things can get retweeted out of context means that readers can just project whatever they imagine you mean onto you and then others can take that up and it can spiral very quickly so i actually my own i've done well out of using Twitter um, in the sense that I've got lots of followers and I've managed to draw people's attention to my writing and speaking but I don't use it I don't know if anyone's noticed but I don't really use it for arguing I don't think it's a it doesn't work for me at all okay so if somebody says something you don't agree with you just you just leave it I mean uh, yeah I just ignore it I mean there is a room I do think Twitter users would do well to understand some of them that you can ignore Things you don't agree with yeah. or even blatant insults, you know. Yeah. Well, when you have followers, like how many followers do you have on Twitter? 50,000? No, I've got 40 something, I think. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I. So when you have that many people following, there's going to be a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of argy bargy. My mentions are a, quite a mess sometimes, but it just doesn't work for me as a format. And I don't feel it makes me angry as well. I don't like. I'm not very fond of accounts that have like one dimensional tone that's either com- always angry or always snide. Um, I think you can read, you can read that, follow lots of those accounts and find yourself getting really into a negative state of mind, maybe like mirror neurons or something firing, but you can get very angry too. And it's not really in a kind of authentic anger. It's just, it's just being whipped up um, mm. by transmission. The so I try and anger. Yeah, I don't really, I think, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think gender critical feminists or radical feminists or people who agree with me on some things um, should watch out themselves that they don't end up in bubbles, that they don't end up being whipped up by each other into frenzies they wouldn't 
otherwise be in. You know, we are subject to the same sorts of distorting Twitter effects as trans activists are. Um, and I would like to see more kind of recognition of that, I guess, sometimes. I think there's a real huge defensiveness on our side about you know, we, we're always good people and we always mean well. And we, you know, that's not true. There's some real assholes on our side as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a danger, isn't it? It's like, it's so polarised. And when we portray other people as the enemy, well, then it kind of can justify mm -hmm. us doing mm -hmm. lots of things. It's a very exactly. dangerous area to be in. Exactly. Now, the thing was, right, I put it up on Facebook, it was when your book came out and I said, fantastic, you know, Kathleen Stock's book is out. And somebody um, who I'd never met in real life actually responded saying, did you not see what she has written about uh, some feminists in the book? And I said, no, I haven't mm. read that. I've just started reading it. And <gasps> I um, criticised so, other feminists. <laughs> yeah. So uh, some some group of feminists are, are very angry with you. Yes. Yes, although again, I don't really keep up. Like, I'm not one of these people that's got some kind of Google alert on my name, so I don't know what the latest is. But um, yeah, I criticise Julia Long as one of them, and I'm sure your listeners who are involved with all this will know that that's what I do. But I mean, it's in two lines of the book. Of it. again, there's been sort of mortal outrage. Um, my book is also being misrepresented by some feminists. And as you know, I don't mind people disagreeing with me, but actually factually, um, they're saying things, say, saying I say things I don't say. So I would urge anyone who's read something really critical from the feminist side of things of my book to actually check, you know, fair enough if you still think I'm an asshole and disagree with me afterwards, but it's very annoying to be misrepresented, um, so can you explain what is your criti uh, your criticism of Julia Long? Well, I actually... Her, her ideas. I mean, I've, there's lots of things I disagree with Julia Long about, but the one bit of the book where I talk about an article that she wrote and she's criticising... <coughs> excuse me. She's criticising um, the woman, Women's Place organisation, which is the one I mentioned earlier, um, for having trans women on the platform. So these were events which took place under enormous hostility um, and I, sometimes they had gender critical trans women on the platform like Christina Harrison and Debbie Hayton alongside other women and um, they did that I think totally sensibly it was a great strategy because it showed to um, the public that they were not transphobic that they were not against and it's not about women versus trans women. It's about a, a coalition. And um, in this article, Julia Long is incredibly snide about the trans women on the platform. And she says that they're bamboozling the audience. Um, you know, she just makes out that the audience of Women's Place um, meetings are stupid and capitulating and somehow dazzled by trans women in a way that's, I don't know, not feminist um, and that women's place should not have platformed them there. And I just said, that's, you know, I expressed strong disagreement with that in that section. Right. And then after that, you know, Julia, I believe, did a whole hour's worth of ranting about my book with Posey Parker and has written a critical review of it. Um, and various others have written stuff too. And it's all spiralled out of control now. So now apparently I'm, you know, the claim is that I'm being really exclusionary of trans widows. That is the, the colloquial term for um, women married to late transitioning trans women who whose marriages end. And of course, right. I'm not being <laughs> exclusionary to trans widows. And there's actually other parts of the book where I'm very vocal in defense of them. And that point had nothing to do with trans widows as far as I was concerned. Um, but, you know, as outrage builds, oh my goodness, and oh. as Twitter bubbles <laughs> all talk to each other and shouted, you know, uh, yeah, stories change, morph. And before you know it, my book is really exclusionary about trans widows and various other things that's not true either. So um, that's an right. example of our side 
Yeah, I, I think you make a really yeah. great point in the book that on one side there is all oh, the, the claim that the other people are being transphobic and on the other side it's the claim that the other people are being misogynistic. And these terms are just thrown around just mm-hmm. so loosely as a way, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a way of silencing. So it 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 gets <laughs> really destroys the possibility of there being an open, rational debate between two people with different ideas. You know, just yeah. once you start using these names, it's just like it's gone yeah. down the drain. I think there's a time and a place to use the words transphobic and misogynist. Definitely. There are people who whose active actions clearly, you know, by by any standard betray severe hatred of women or hatred of trans people as a group. Um but the words should not be devalued by being used whenever you want to get your opponent to shut up. And yeah, yeah that's um, exactly what I mean. Yeah. 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 So, and that's the point I try and make in the book too. So I'm actually quite careful to use misogyny where I, I mean, I, there's always going to be exceptions and I, I get angry like everyone else. So I'm sure if you went back in my Twitter back catalog, you'd find times where I'd probably use misogynist um, sort of in a weaponized way, but I, I don't do it you know, as far as I can help. Um, and I really try and save it for the times when it's obviously applicable. And same for any kind of, like homophobic too, actually. Yeah. I don't think, yeah, no, there's I lots do of times agree. homophobia uh, yeah. gets chucked around that, that I don't think are appropriate. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree exactly with what you're saying, that these things do exist, but at the same time, the words are used sometimes inappropriately and in a way that cheapens or, mm-hmm. you know, takes away from the fact that there are actual, you know, yeah. homophobes, yeah, transphobes, yeah. misogynists out there. Mm-hmm. So th- the heat comes off of them completely. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. People who, yeah. I mean, we risk a backlash, actually, I think. These words are just transphobia in particular, just used so indiscriminately of anyone who's trying to raise questions about things like radical mastectomies of 20 year olds or, you know, um, males in women's prisons. If you're using transphobe in that context, then you will lose the capacity to pick out the genuine transphobia. People will get sick of the word. They will just think, oh, it's just being used politically and weaponized. So, you know, so we really need to keep a space for the meaning of that word. Mm. Well, one thing in my Facebook post that I did uh, change slightly from your book, <laughs> uh, you have material girls, why reality matters for feminism. And I put in brackets and for everyone. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> it's not just a book for feminists, actually. I really mean, important. The feminists yeah, would say yeah. it's not even a book for feminists. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's because if you think about what's happening there's, an, there's a concerted attempt, which just seems to be quite successful in many national institutions are going along with it, this, this attempt to get rid of talking about sex, um, to not mention males, females as such, to make things gender neutral, to make language gender neutral, or to prioritise gender identity over sex. Now, that is going to affect nearly everyone, not just women. Obviously, it's going to affect men, it's going to affect religious minorities for whom having men and women are really important. Um, It's going to affect medicine, it's going to affect sport, as we've seen. There's a thousand contexts in which pointing out that there are males and females and a difference between the two are essential to life because we're a sexually dimorphic species (laughs) that reproduce um, through uh, sexual reproduction. So and that involves a male and a female. No, you can't get away from it. So that means that if we lose the words to be able to describe that, we all lose, including trans people. You know, you can't explain why someone's trans if you can't say what their sex is. Mm, yeah, yeah, it has implications for everyone. And another point that you make in the book that I was like, yes, yes, is <laughs> is that it's a generational divide as well. Like m- massively so, I would say, like kids today mm. who are in their teens have grown up with this idea um, that everybody has a gender identity and that people are who they say they are. And um, I, I think what's really interesting is that in parallel with the, the move towards a gender identity is that there's been the, the Me Too movement. Mm. And yeah, and people don't, uh, you know, who might be 
saying hashtag me too i've been assaulted sexually assaulted or sexually abused um in in a situation with a stranger you know at the same time then are saying i accept anybody to be who they say they are according to their gender identity so there's yeah. a kind of a contradiction there Oh yeah, there's there's a lot of contradictions in this whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that one is amazing to me, absolutely amazing, and um, that you can move from a movement that's absolutely predi- a sort of popular movement, Me Too movement, which is predicated on the idea of males ag- aggressing females sexually. Not all of them, but you know, most of us have a story, um, or at least one. And then move from that almost seamlessly to some kind of elaborate um, self-abnegation where so-called feminists now say, you know, of course, trans women should be in our the spaces where we undress and sleep as if something magical happens to people when they put on a dress, you know. It just doesn't. People are thinking magically. What was there before will be there afterwards. <laughs> um, and it's not a character reference, as I keep saying. It's not a character reference for the male sex to say that women should have spaces where they are protected because that's safeguarding. It excludes the few, you know, excludes everyone in order to protect from the few aggressors. Mm-hmm. So it's bonkers. Um, and uh I can't explain it except to say that maybe it's a back part of a backlash in some way. The pendulum swung back almost instantly. Yeah. Do you think it has got to do with relig- religion too as well? Like, I think there's a, sort of religious archetypes involved, you know, in the sense, um, I don't mean of like signing you up to any particular faith, but within religion there are sort of recurring motifs like redemption, rebirth, um, transformation metamorphosis uh transubstantiation you know all of those things now we don't most of us are athe- well many of us are atheists these days we don't we have more secular society but we the power of those archetypes doesn't disappear that it just re-emerges in different ways now so dualism is another one the idea that the soul is separate from the body you know the modern version of that is your gender identity you've got a gendered soul um that's distinct from the bo- the sexed body so I think it's fascinating that aspect of this that quite a lot of it is incredibly familiar from other cultural discourses but it's just painted in new ways that and people don't even notice yeah. the kind of religious aspect mm. the mantras the priests uh the holy days like holy week pride week <laughs> you know all the different you when you start thinking about all the parallels we've got a new religion I don't yeah. have it I'm still an atheist but <laughs> yeah it is the human, the human need, I think, and that we think of ourselves, uh, humans, I mean, you know, as being so rational and scientific and we need evidence <laughs> for this. And then we fall into these things. Yeah. I mean, I could be falling into these things and not realise that I am because well, once you're, because we, we don't know that we are when we are. Yeah. But I, I think it's like there's a space that has been left by the vacation of institutional religion, maybe. I totally agree. I think that's obviously true. Um, never have I seen such, I mean, you talked about the generational gap, but this this generation of teenagers and 20-somethings, are, um, many of them are so concerned with doing the right thing, so moral in some sense of moral. You know, I'm not saying they're good at right 100%, but, you know, they really think about every aspect of their life. They want to control every aspect of their life they feel huge guilt and shame when they think they've messed up. These are all old emotions that the Catholic Church used to, I'm a Catholic, you know, used to, ex-Catholic, used to, you know, produce in people and now people are producing for themselves. (laughs) Mm. Somebody, and I I wish I could just acknowledge the people who say these things because (laughs) it's not my idea, but this idea of there being... um, Oh, I think it might have been Benjamin Boyce who said it at one point, talking about the idea of original sin. Mm-hmm. You know that with, and I, I came from, I come from a Catholic background too. But we're born with this idea that we have an original sin, that there's something that we yeah, have inside expiate. of us that's bad. Whereas now we don't have that. 
So our young people growing up today. So there's the idea that they can aspire to being perfect, morally perfect. There is no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although I do. I mean, that sounds interesting, but I also think that they, from observation, and I should say us, you know, I'm not immune to any of these things myself, but, you know, they, there's a sense, I think, of, of guilt there too. It, they don't really believe they can be perfect. They, I think that there's a lot of shame, particularly for women. I mean, a lot of it will be culturally produced as well. It's not coming, it, these things are not happening in a vacuum. They're part of our zeitgeist. And um, they're part of a cultural moment and they're produced by things like Instagram and TikTok and um, there'll be all sorts of cultural forces producing all this. Uh, so I don't want to suggest that it's anyone's fault that this is happening. It's just, um, yeah. it's just There's where we multiple, are. Yeah, multiple factors that, that sure. yeah, go into it. Yeah. I actually think feminism is one of the contributory factors that has brought us to here. <laughs> you know, the, um in what way? That, um, do you know, you talk about John Money and uh, Robert Stoller uh, in, in your book. And mm -hmm. so it was connected to the intersex, the treatment of intersex children. Mm -hmm. And the that's where kind of the first time the, the phrase gender role is used in gender identity. But um, that uh, feminists in the 60s and 70s, uh, really just hooked onto this idea of gender so that it's not it's not biology. That means mm. that women are treated the way they are. We're treated this way because of culture. Yes. And it's that word because is is. Is important because, you know, causal there can be many causal influences resulting in a particular effect. So women. Um, women's disadvantage, structural disadvantage can be partly to do with culture and partly to do with culture hooking on to biological aspects of women's existence, like pregnancy, um, for instance, being the obvious one. So um, feminists in the 70s, as I say in the book, they just, some of them anyway, really wanted to get away from the idea that we're determined in particular directions by our biology, so that we ought to be at home looking after children because we have wombs. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, but some of them thought that the way to do this was to deny that womanhood was anything to do with biology. So like woman, so anatomy is not destiny. They would say, so, I mean, anatomy isn't destiny in some ways, but it, anatomy has a role to play in one's destiny most of the time. <laughs> so there'll be other things that have a role to play too. And this degree of nuance just didn't seem there in the kind of most prominent, um, social constructionist accounts so uh i yeah i i think i agree with you um that that wasn't feminists finest finest hour and these were academic feminists as well i mean these like mm. people like Catherine mckinnon yeah i mean i can understand where they're coming from and they wanted to change the situation as it was at the time and of course little did they think that it would bring us to this point but who could have predicted that we could get to this point I don't know no it's true you'd have had to be you'd have had to have quite a lot of foresight to see precisely how this idea that womanhood is divorced from biology would be weaponized um in the directions it's been used by politically by trans activism but I still think you could have seen that there there would be problems once you remove biology from the grounds of feminism because there's so many things that happen to women partly as a result of their physical state that you can no longer really talk about so mm. you know feminism has not been very good about talking uh, academic feminism has not been good about talking about motherhood for instance part i also think partly because a lot of academic feminists like have children late or when they do have children their career is more important you know there's sort of sociological reasons why but they're not, academic feminists are not really good at talking about what most women want to talk about and what matters to them, I think. Which, which is? Well, things like motherhood, Mother, which motherhood. is still really important to loads yeah. and loads of women who might not call themselves feminists, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, mm. there's a sort of real taboo about prioritising 
motherhood politically, it's seen as exclusionary of those people that can't have children, for instance, and, you know, all sorts of stuff comes up. But I think mothers should be represented in feminism properly mm. and their interests. Here, here. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, and that would tie in with the body as well. And we can't, we just, we can, we can negate the importance of the body, but it is, the body is still going to be important whether we acknowledge it or not. Mm-hmm. It just, yeah. it just is. Of course. Um, you use that word there, exclusionary. That's just like <laughs> the, 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 another big thing that's going on these days. It's exclusionary. You know, we have, everything has to be, inclusion, diversity, mm-hmm. and what's equality. Mm-hmm. Well, so, I mean, yeah. yeah so All of those in. words are sort of... Um, Great ideas. Sound nice when yeah, you don't... Yeah. But nobody really knows what the hell they mean in practice. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, I was interested too in your discussion of intersectionality. I'm not a fan of intersectionality, but you have okay. a very a more nuanced view on it and you think there are... <laughs> Uh, positive aspects that we can take from it. Yeah. Um, I think intersectionality has got a bad rap, although I do understand why. Partly because, you know, as ideas go out into popular culture, they tend to get simplified and reduced and often to a point where they're no longer really fit for purpose. And I think that's probably happened with the popular conception of intersectionality. Um, and also it's been weaponized, as we've just described in, with other concepts. So, um, you know, there are um, people on the f- so-called feminist side of the fence who will use intersectionality as some kind of, um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, like squash ladder or something like, you know, it, mentally ranking different identity groups in terms of oppression and then um, anyone who's higher up as a group in comparison to lower groups has no political platform or should, should be silenced, you know, which is just not a a nuanced way to think about huge numbers of people who might, whose circumstances might all be very different. Um, But, but in theory and the way that I understand it from people like Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw, is that it just points out that sometimes when you fall under more than one, heading as it were more than one group women and you're black for instance there may be um disadvantages that you face that are are you so you face disadvantages because you're a woman and you face disadvantages because you're black and they may be more than the sum of their parts particularly when you put that into social structures which cannot really conceive of these things as interacting so tend to to um look at you one dimensionally so um i think she's got really interesting things to say and she gives lots and lots of cases like concrete cases where this has been the case in american law for black women for instance but crenshaw says um that uh the fact she's pointing all this out does not mean um that there is no such thing as the interests of women as a group and she also points out that no one makes the moves against um, anti-racism that they make against feminism in this respect. So in other words, you can make generalizations about black people that don't apply to all, <laughs> all black people without somehow the category collapsing. But feminism seems to think, some feminists, not, me, not my kind, seem to think that as soon as you start talking about women and you can find women where there are exceptions to what you're saying, that somehow that shows that women are not a political group. So I don't know, that's probably a bit complicated for anyone that hasn't read that bit of the book. But I just, I, the, the headline is, I think there's lots of interesting stuff in intersectionality is just getting misunderstood. Mm. No, I do agree that there is an interse- interesting aspect to it. Mm-hmm. I just, I probably, my problem with it is the focus on oppression and privilege and mm. oppression and privilege. Yeah. And I think that that's a, uh, yeah, and I think you do actually mention that as well about privilege. In the well, book. I'm not a fan of the concept of privilege either when it's used as the mere absence of disadvantage. <laughs> I think that's too binary. And um, the absence of disadvantage is not in itself a privilege. And that move, I think. So, I, I mean, I have yet to kind of, I want to write actually write something one day about that. That's on my list of things to do. 
Oh, great. But um, it's it's certainly contributing to the toxicity of this kind of mm. whole uh, screaming match. Yeah. Um, I should probably think about wrapping it up here now. So okay. <laughs> I want to ask you, I mean, I was just looking, even in the last few weeks, all of the things that have been happening in the last few weeks, mm. you know, um, the student in Scotland who was under investigation for saying women have vaginas, uh, the Maya for Statter case, the We Spa, am I pronouncing it right, even in America? I where, don't know. <laughs> have you heard about that one? I've heard about it. I don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah. And when you put it together on the hashtag, it's Wispa. And they go, oh, <laughs> there's a chocolate bar. Cadbury's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't know what's going on. Um, there's uh, Laurel Hubbard, the trans woman yeah, competing yeah. in the Olympics. And yeah. there's the Stonewall stuff that's happening in the UK. Mm. In in some ways, I think Ireland's is a little bit behind the UK. Uh, not a little bit, possibly a good bit. I was at... Um, in where I work, in the college where I work, we were brought to, it was a, a gendered diversity workshop and we were told, we were recommended to use pronouns. We mm-hmm. were told that puberty blockers are reversible mm. and that they reduce harm. And this is academics being taught things that are incorrect. Yeah. And I, I had huge alarm bells about that. Uh, so I think that that's happening here now. It's probably going to get more that mm. way than that's still happening was. in the uk too though is it yeah. academia is think i think universities will be the last places perversely will be amongst the last places for some sense to penetrate in this issue so um yeah those workshops are still happening in in british universities too right unfortunately yeah because it's just very simple oversimplified i've seen um slides from presentations to oxford university faculty that have the mermaids uh, gender spectrum with a Barbie doll at one end and Ken at the other and some jelly babies in the middle. That's the kind of level of conceptual sophistication <laughs> we're dealing with. So, yeah, it's hor- horrifying. But there's a lot going on at the moment in Britain. And I think it's that it's the sort of, if you imagine like, or I imagine a kind of massive rock being sh- dumped in the middle of a loch. <laughs> And the ripples just gradually going outwards to the shore. You know, we are seeing the ripples now in all these areas, in sport, in freedom of expression, in child health, in prisons, you know. And the, and the, the original rock was gender identity ide- ideology. You know, the idea that gender identity is more important than sex. So people didn't notice the ripples when they were far from the shore <laughs> or they could just say it wasn't happening. But now you can't say it's not happening because Laurel Hubbard is in the Olympics for instance. So we just have to acknowledge what's going on now. So what do you think is is going to happen in the next few months? Or do you see that there is a change happening now? Uh, I think there's definitely a change because it was so extreme three years ago. It was so difficult to get any kind of journalist to write responsibly about it. We were always being called anti-trans, for instance, which is just not true. So there's definitely a change because some aspects of the sort of centrist press and right wing press, you know, for obvious reasons, are writing about it. Not not necessarily for good reasons, I think even, but they're writing about it. So it's happening. When you say not for good reasons, well, I think some right wing outlets see this as a kind of wedge issue. You know, they're basically laughing because the left brought this on themselves to some extent. The left have gone along with all this. They've suppressed discussion of it. So that leaves an opening for people who don't particularly necessarily care about feminism to suddenly start writing, um, you know. And I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I think that's better than nothing, actually, because it still gets the word out there. So, And I've written for some of them myself. <laughs> but in an ideal world, The Guardian, the BBC and so on, the New York Times would be talking about this responsibly too. Whereas the BBC at the moment, every seems like every three days they have on their website some some picture of a non-binary teenager with a headline like, it was so great to find my true self <laughs> or something like that or something about puberty blockers or whatever. So we've got some way to go. Mm. Uh, it's patchy, that's what I'm saying. So you haven't noticed a kind of a sea change in, in recent weeks. Sometimes I think, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> it's definitely changing. And then I think, no, no, I it's think not. it's changing. It's really hard to 
to notice when you're in the middle of it, isn't it? Like you don't know whether yeah. it's just a kind of storm or a, I don't know, you, you just don't know what you're looking at. I think we'll have to have a bit of distance. But the fact that my book has come out with a mainstream publisher and Helen Joyce's book, Trans, is about to come out with a mainstream publisher. And I've read that book. It's fantastic in terms of filling in the factual background of trans activism. So my book's more about the ideas. Her book is about the ideas plus a lot of um, empirical information about how we got here and what the consequences are, the effects are. So I really think that, that book is going to make a difference as well. And then, you know, let's just keep going and see where we get. Yeah, yeah. And the more people speaking, the, the more debate that we have. I mean, mm -hmm. I think personally, my view is it's communication. It's mm -hmm. open uh, debate and conversation uh, is, is the key thing here. Uh, and if that happens, that, you know, there could be more tolerance on, on all sides. That's probably yeah. a bit idealistic, but... I think so. People yeah. need to understand on both sides that the other side aren't necessarily evil. On both sides. You yeah. know, I think there's good intentions on both sides and there's lack of understanding on both sides. Now, no one's, you know, we're not going to get a perfect world where we all agree. But um, we have to live together. So, you know, purists of either side, on either side, will not get the world they want. Unfortunately, maybe. I don't know. But that's just the way it is. Yeah. OK, well, thank you so much for speaking to me and uh, best of luck. Continue good luck with with the book, which Thank I think you. is excellent. And I Thanks so much for having it. me, Colette. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Spokes. Thanks for listening. If you did enjoy this episode or got anything from it, please do check out our other episodes and don't forget to like and subscribe and maybe throw down a review or give us a few stars if uh, you're so inclined. Spokes is produced by Colette Colfer and Terry Hackett. Looking for a new podcast to listen to? Here's what we love, courtesy of ACAST Recommends. Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and along with Tracy Cox, who is an international sex expert and author of 17 books, I co-host the podcast Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy, and it's S-E-X-T-O-K. And the reason we have it as Sex Talk is because we happen to be viral TikTok <laughs> stars at the moment with some of our videos getting over 1.1 million views. So listen to us. I am totally shy and squeamish. She is super open, British, and hilarious. Listen to us each week as Tracy answers three anonymously sourced questions about all the things you talk to your girlfriends about. Listen on Acast or wherever you get your podcast, Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy. Acast, 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 Acast recommends. recommends.